Hello, and welcome to our podcast, Where the Dark Corners Are. Travels hostess. Tonight we have a road trip with the panda. In 1995, a team of paranormal travel podcasters found an abandoned cub in the haunted Arctic. After some kick-ass paranormal training and his first alien kill, he was ready. He was ready. ready. So, if ghosts, serial killers, or monsters in the dark got you scared, don't hesitate to call the Polar Bear. The Polar Bear. <laughs> you should get us a duo song so you could just do one song. Yeah. Bad boys. Bad bears. <laughs> bad, bad bears. bears bad, bad bears. bears. <laughs> what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they haunt you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tonight is actually a special edition, a special episode. And as such, we're going to release it on the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. So, Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005. You were what? 11? 10. About? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was in 9 or 10. I think it was 9 going on 10. Okay. Maybe, I don't know. Were and you, you were? 10. Were you in America yet? No. I moved here when I was 11. I was an alien. Yeah. So, you were still in the Ukraine. learning English, yeah. Okay. Did you hear anything about Hur- Hurricane Katrina? No, I don't think so. I don't think I was old enough to or care or pay attention. Okay. Yeah. You had your own problems in the Ukraine? Yeah. Okay. Kid problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, believe it or not, her, I don't know why I can't say this word, Hurricane Katrina is actually, if not the most, one of the biggest natural disasters in American history. To kind of give a little context for New Orleans, because a lot of people don't understand that Hurricane Katrina actually hit Florida first, but when it did, it was a Category 3, so it wasn't as significant because it kind of backed out, kind of went along the coastline, and then landed back on the 28th, 29th of August, 2005, in in New Orleans. That's when the big shit happened. So was it out of... Uh, So when it hit... No, like, what's... So category f- when it hits Katrina, it becomes a category five. Oh, so it's, I, I'm saying, so what is it allowed? It's like 10? You know, I actually don't know that. That's a great question. Oh. But on August 23rd, it hit Florida first and then like gained speed. And when it hit on that Monday, Monday night, t- it was just catastrophe. So, kind of just give a little background. New Orleans itself was built on swampland. So, it was, you know, it's waterlogged anyways. Mm -hmm. And a lot of places were Native American burial grounds. And the bulk of the city itself is basically 50% below sea level. So, of course, they have, you know, a series of levees to prevent the sea level from coming in, the sea from coming in. Now, in 1722, the first major storm actually hits the city and actually nearly destroys it. And between 1759 and now, and we're talking over 170 hurricanes has come through. But Katrina was the absolute worst. 
when she hit, I don't think they anticipated how horrific she was going to be because even the mayor was kind of late in calling the evacuation because they, I don't think they realized how strong, how powerful, how hard she was going to hit. When she does, 53 levees get breached, 200,000 homes are destroyed, 81,000 businesses get destroyed, 175 schools get destroyed, six major hospitals get destroyed, and this is not a good time for hospitals to get destroyed. 35,000 people had to be evacuated. You know, those, I'm sure you've seen since, those crazy scenes of the car, Coast Guards rescuing people who are stuck on the roof. rooftops. And, yes. Yeah. And when the levees get breached, basically folding under the pressure of the water, 80% of the city gets swallowed. And as such, as it's being flooded and people who opted to stay because, for one, couldn't evacuate, could, didn't have places to go, opted to stay. And between that and, you know, every other scenario you could possibly imagine. They used the Superdome. They eventually do use the Superdome. They do open it up. But Katrina ends up killing 1,392 people. And, you know, to me, that would probably be a rough estimate simply because there were a lot of extra deaths, I think, that happened afterwards. One of the scariest things, I mean, because I remember when this happened, and you, where we live, we have fires, we have floods, we have power outages, but we don't have it, like, in this type of capacity in terms of 80% of your cities underwater. But lawlessness was apparently really running rampant. Like, gangs of people were t- attacking people who stayed in their homes, basically committing a lot of atrocities because law enforcement was short-staffed. They Even when eventually the military came in, before that even happened, even in the Superdome, there were, with the military being there, there were problems. But believe it or not, one of the darkest pair of deaths associated with Hurricane Katrina actually happens just over a year after Katrina. So, like I said before, when Katrina started up, she hit Florida first, then she moved on to New Orleans and other parts of the South. A lot of people don't realize because because New Orleans took a lot of the media attention, but other states got damaged and were without electricity and had all these problems as well. But there was one couple that actually gets featured in the New York Times as they, like a few other survivalists, decided to remain in the French Quarter. And the thing about the French Quarter was it was elevated enough to not really have the kind of problems that other parts of the city had. In fact, that's why we still have the French Quarter today because of the way it was, its position and the elevation that it's at. So the couple that I'm talking about is the young couple by the name of Zachary Bowen and Addie Hall. A little background on them. We'll start with Zach. Zachary Morgan Bowen was born on May 15, 1978 in Bakersfield, California. He grew up in California, but eventually moved to New Orleans, attending high school and living with his father. But Zach had some problems with depression, even though he does actually finish high school. And after graduation, he lands a bartending job when he's 18 years old. While he's bartending, he meets a 28-year-old woman named Lana Shapak. And as a couple, they have a child, they get married, and then they have a second child. With these new responsibilities in May of 2000, Zach actually joins the U.S. Army and able to, to provide for his family. He ends up doing tours in both Kosovo and Iraq, rising to the rank of sergeant. It also should be noted that during his tour in Iraq, he ended up doing some time at the infamous Abu Ghraib prison and to make to be very clear, this prison was known for torturing and executing its prisoners. You know, this is a scenario thanks to fucking Saddam Hussein. Also during his time in Iraq, he becomes friends with a girl whose family owned a shop in Iraq, and unfortunately, her family store ended up being bombed, and the girl, along with the rest of her family, get killed. 
I don't know who bombs the little shop. I don't know if it was the Americans or the Iraqis, but he's pretty much fucking devastated when this happens, and he wants out. So he starts to fail his required testing, and even though he earns a NATO medal and a presidential unit citation, which is often given to soldiers who show extreme bravery in the face of armed forces, and despite the fact that his own CO recommended that he be honorably discharged after his service, he's only given a general discharge. And the problem with this is, if you're given a general discharge, all of your health benefits get taken away from you. And this was very upsetting to him. I mean, he sounds like he earned an honorable discharge and he was entitled to one, but he didn't get it. But the bigger problem is this means he loses his benefits to therapy, which is a problem when you're suffering from PS, PSTD. PSTD. PTSD. PTSD, thank you. <laughs> Post-traumatic stress syndrome. And he was, especially coming from not one front of war, but two, Kosovo and in Iraq. Now, when he gets home, it's evident that the war has changed him. He's a different person, and he's struggling with what transpired to, during both tours. And again, he doesn't have the health benefits to speak to a professional regarding the struggles. So sadly, the changes in him trickled down to him getting divorced, and even though he remained in his children's life as co-parent, you know, his, his marriage is over. Zach eventually gets back to New Orleans and starts taking on various bartending jobs. As such, while working as a bartender, he meets another bartender who was working at the Spotted Cat, and her name was Addie Hall. A little bit about Addie. Adrian Addie Hall was born on January 15, 1976. Sadly, as a child, she grew up in an abusive home, and according to some of her friends, she had been molested as a child. And even more sadly, later in life, she had a string of abusive relationships. So she's, you know, she's got some issues. And eventually she, she was born or she had lived in North Carolina. And eventually she'll leave and come to New Orleans. And, you know, again, per her friends, she was someone who really loved writing poetry, dancing, making art, basically living a bohemian lifestyle and felt like she was really submerging herself into this new community in the French Quarter and people would often see her riding her little bike around the French Quarter you know getting around however because of the child molestation some believed that she had a bipolar disorder now in some of the articles I read her bipolar disorder was undiagnosed but in others I read she was diagnosed but she was not taking her medication regularly to be effective so basically, when they meet, these two people have some unaddressed behavioral issues, and based on the information I read, it seemed like instead of seeking treatment, they both found solace in alcohol and eventually drugs. In fact, the, it's been said like their, their liking the, the drinking was a serious bonding factor for them both. Makes sense. So now at the end of August 2005, you know, here comes Hurricane Katrina. They decide to remain in the city in, at Addie's apartment during the hurricane. And again, she's got an apartment in the French Quarter. And, and because of this, they basically end up setting up camp. Again, they're out without power. There's not a lot of food. There's not a lot of resources. Everything's shut down. And, I mean, they bust out the barbecue pits. They have, you know, bust out can of beans. And they got a... A lot of alcohol. In fact, alcohol kind of became their cash crop where they would trade alcohol for other goods like food, water, any other needed items. People would come by and they would make them drinks and, you know, kind of be sociable, kind of have a like, little party every night. And as part of their supply, I read that Zach even broke into a local bar to not only swipe the ice because it was really, really hot. Again, you, have, you don't have any air conditioning you, you need ice to kind of make your mix your drinks, but he also kind of swiped the booze because no one else is drinking mm -hmm. it because New Orleans is shut down. Now, also at this time, the cops would roll by and let them know that it was dangerous, and it was. Like I said, you, we had a lot of lawlessness going on that I, was just unreal. And 
apparently when the cops would, would drive by, Addie would flash them, you know, Mardi Gras style. And that, of course, would, you know, the cops would roll by a little bit more frequently <laughs> with a flash. Either way, here or there, at this point in time, they meet this guy named Squirrel who basically lets them know that he's their go-to guy if they ever need anything, drugs in particular. Wink, wink. <laughs> Correct. So they, if they weren't doing drugs prior, they definitely start getting into drugs at this point in time. How long do we know how long uh, New Orleans was shut down for? Like how, like That's the actually recovery oh. period that it took to go back to semi-normal? I don't know that answer. Okay. I mean, when you have 80% of your city underwater, yeah. I can, I, my guess would be years, but I think the French Quarter opened up sooner simply because there was no significant damage to it. But either way, during their time when Katrina shut down the all of New Orleans, like I said before, they were featured in the New York Times uh, Mag the New York Times as basically the king and queen of the French Quarter because they were doing so well surviving because they were they were working with what they had yeah. right so I mean you can even see their picture in the New York Times and like I said they were dubbed the king and queen of the French Quarter so when life gets back to normal it becomes a bit of a struggle for them not only do they have unaddressed behavioral health issues, they're drinking, they're doing drugs, and their friends are noticing that their relationship is really starting to get volatile. And and we're and it's volatile on both sides, okay? He's having violent outbursts directed at her. She's having violent outbursts directed at him, but hers include hitting him. Now, to save the relationship, they decide to move in together. They find an upstairs apartment located at 826 North Rampart Street, which is directly above the iconic Priestess Miriam Voodoo Spiritual Temple. But them moving in together doesn't work. In fact, everything escalates. They're fighting, they're drinking, the drug use, which apparently their drug of choice was cocaine. Whether it's terrible idea. <laughs> it is. It's the worst. Now, whether or not it's true... Addie comes to believe that at some point Zach has cheated on her. You know, they're fighting so much. Again, whether or not it's true, she believes that he's cheating on her. And as a result, she goes to the landlord and she demands that he remove Zach from the lease. Well, the landlord tells her that she needs to work it out with Zach because they can't just remove him. In fact, I think he even put down the deposit like the first and last month's rent. Sadly, this conversation with the landlord will be the last time anyone sees Addie alive. Oh. So, what happens? How does this all come out? I don't know. On October 18th, <laughs> at approximately 8.30 p.m., 2006, the police receive a call from the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel. They call to report that they have found a male body on the roof of the parking garage. And looking around... And considering the scenario, it's clear that the man had either jumped or fallen to his death from five stories above. Homicide gets dispatched, but they come to the conclusion that this is suicide, not a homicide. And that's the opinion until the coroner checks the man's pocket. They come across some interesting items. They come across Zach's army dog tags, the keys to the apartment with a note that has the address to their apartment. I'm going to read what the first part says. Zachary writes, This is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. And in the note, he tells them to send a patrol car to their apartment at North Rampart Street. So the two detectives head to the apartment that they shared, to investigate the matter further. When they arrive, they find a horrifyingly gruesome scene. Per their investigation, here's what happened that led to the horrifyingly gruesome scene. Around 1 o'clock a.m. on Thursday, October 5th, so 12 days prior, in 2006, Zach was drunk and arguing with Addie. 
During the argument, Zach put his hands around Addie's neck and strangled her to death. She's on the futon. Her corpse is on the futon. He falls asleep next to the corpse on the futon. He wakes up sometime during the night, morning time. He commits necrophilia potentially a couple times, and then goes back to sleep, wakes up, and goes to work. Now, his co-workers will recall that Zach did seem acting strangely. He was wearing sunglasses and a hat and being very quiet, but that was at work. At home, however, after leaving her body in their bed for several days, he eventually moves her body to the tub where over the course of several days, he begins to cut up her body in the bathtub with a hacksaw and a knife. And then with her body parts, he begins to place the pieces of her corpse into and on top of the stove for cooking as well as the refrigerator. So he gives her a haircut and he places her head in a pot and puts it on top of the the front of the stove. He then places her feet and her hands in another pot and puts it on the back burner of the stove. Her arms and legs were placed in a roasting pan inside the oven. And some people actually say that her limbs looked like they were seasoned and there were even diced potatoes and carrots found on the counter next to the stove. But for the rest of her, like her torso, he put her, those parts, in a plastic bag in the fridge and the law enforcement was thinking like he was going to take care of this scenario later. So they believe he did this in an attempt to separate her bone from flesh, separate the meat basically, because he was thinking that that would be easier to dispose her body. And in addition to cutting her up and putting her in various places in the kitchen, he also began writing messages on the wall. He used a silver color spray paint writing the words like, please call my wife, I love her, I'm a total failure, look in the oven, please help me stop the pain. And there was even like arrows pointing to the oven. Now when her friends asked after her, Zach told them that she had left him and went back to North Carolina. But Zach had a plan. And that plan included suicide. But before he ended his life, you know, making that final decision, he withdrew 1500 from their savings. And basically, he began to super party hard. He, in, even in his writing, his confession, he says, you know, I ate good food, I got good strippers, I'm paraphrasing, and I did good drugs with my friends. And... It was October 17th that he made the final decision, and that's when the police learned of what he had done. So per the instructions, they go to North Rampart, and the first thing that they noticed was the temperature and the lack of smell. Zach had left the air conditioning on set at 60 and had it going full blast. So basically he was making it like a refrigerator. Right. And... Like I said, the other thing they noticed that there was no smell of rotting flesh. Zach, before he jumped, had cleaned the bathroom and, I mean, was, like, spotless. There was no lingering blood or anything like that. And that's how they find her. Her head is in the pot, hands and feet in the other pot, arms and legs in the oven, and her torso is in the refrigerator. So, I want to read to you. Crack cocaine, man. Yep, that'll do it to you. I'm gonna read to you what some what what some of it said. His letter that they found in his pocket when he jumped. Today is Monday, 16 October, 2 a.m. I killed her at 1 a.m. Thursday, 5 October. I very calmly strangled her. It was very quick. Halfway through the task, I stopped and thought about what I was doing. The decision to halt the first idea and move to plan B, the crime scene you are now in, came after a while. I scared myself not by the actions of calmly strangling the woman I have loved for one and a half years and then desecrating her body, but by my entire lack of remorse. I have known forever how horrible of a person I am, ask anyone, and decided to quit my jobs and spend 
the 15 cash I had being happy until I killed myself. So that's what I did. Good food, good drugs, good strippers, good friends, and any loose ends that I may have had. I didn't contact any of my family. So that'll explain the shock and had a fantastic time living out my days. It's just about time now. And he, who writes other things? But, I mean, he's obviously very, he says that he lacks remorse. But the curious part is, is that during his autopsy, they discovered that his body was covered with cigarette burns and per the written confession, part I did not read, Zach burned himself for every year of his life to mark all the mistakes he had made. So it does kind of sound like he was remorseful, but I think the drugs and the mental health issues and for both of them kind of just brought this tragedy to a scenario that ended this way. And that's really sad. Yeah, I didn't know where you were going with it. I was like, whoa. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh okay that's <laughs> we started with the hurricane and ended up here yeah. but this the, this the fall of the rising king queen queen of the french, french quarter. quarter yeah so anyways that's the story the trap i mean there's so many horrible things that happened during Katrina, but i don't know and you know part of what tipped me off to their story was I was watching a show. It was about haunted places, haunted histories. And part of a lot of people who were familiar with this couple really thought them living above the priestess and the land of voodoo kind of... Had con- something to do with it? Co- correct. Contributed yeah, to the overall outcome, the overall tragic outcome. Just used them as playthings. So there's... Yeah, I mean, that's not really normal the way... you try to dispose or do whatever with her remains. Yeah. That's, you know, if anybody commits a crime, you know, they kill, kill somebody, they just go bury him in the woods. That's like a pretty pretty standard thing. Throw him in the dumpster or whatever, whatnot. Or he's in the bayou. He literally, I mean, yeah. there's, there's gator signs throw, out throw there. Throw it out there, the gators. There's literally anything you could do with that body. But, but yeah, the, the pots and pans and shopping it up. And, yeah, and you said something about seasoning that's not, I don't think that would... No, yeah. the, and just to be clear, um, th- when they d- performed the autopsy, there was no signs of cannibalism. That's good. Zach did not. I don't know why there was an indication of seasoning on her limbs, and then only one article had indicated there were chopped potatoes and carrots, mm-hmm. like on the side. Mm. But again, it's still kind of gruesome, mm-hmm. all things considered. But that's it. That is what I have for you guys tonight for our Hurricane Katrina special episode. On to business. Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. We have a Facebook page where the dark corners are. If you have any suggestions, comments, concerns, uh, please send us a friend request and we'll probably approve it (laughs) if you're worthy. (laughs) If you're worthy. worthy. Sponge worthy. (laughs) But in the meantime, if you have a topic or a place or a serial killer that you'd like us to cover, send Panda an email at where the dark corners are at gmail.com. Trent. Final thoughts, Panda. I don't know. I mean, like I said, hurricanes make you do crazy things, I guess. <laughs> Snacking polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Is that, is that really loud? You can, you can hit that? your teeth. You can yeah. hear it. Sorry. That was cool. I didn't didn't know where it was going, and then it was like, "Whoa, that's that's a lot." <laughs> right, it takes a sad twist. But yeah, and you wouldn't imagine like, I think usually couple couples when they go through like traumatic experiences like a hurricane and doing all you know had to do with the doing what they had to do to survive and whatnot kind of brings them closer together, right? Rather than you know they did have mental issues or not, but... Well, it sounded like during those days, exactly what you said, it did bring them together. Mm Kind of like that was their falling in love moment. You know, they had the whole French Quarter pretty much to themselves. And it was their moment of peace and serene, Mm -hmm. which I think also contributes to the shock of how it ends. So... 
All right. So until next time, please remember, only the few can find the beauty of the darkness, which is why we hope to meet you where the dark corners are. (laughs) 